Hello, everyone. Welcome to the broadcast. I'm your host, Greg Bendian. And today I'm uh, just so thrilled and excited to have one of my favorite musicians in the world and uh, someone that I've been a fan of for over 25 years following all of his work in different situations. And uh, we're going to talk about all that today. He's a wonderful guitarist and keyboardist and arranger and uh, just an all around musician and, and a wonderful guy. Uh, some of you may know him as Lord Cornelius Plum, and some of you may know him as I do uh, as Dave Gregory. Welcome, Dave. Well, thanks, Greg. That was an introduction. That's uh, very humbling. Thank you very much. Nice to well, meet you. Nice to meet you, sir. And, and thanks so much for taking the time to chat today. Pleasure. Well, I, I have so many questions for you, Dave, and, and, and we'll try to get in as much as we can. But, uh, you know, for so many of us, XTC has been a gold standard of so many areas of music, be it songwriting or playing and performances, production. Uh, it's just all the best sounds. And, uh, you know, I'm, I have some questions I want to get into about some of those details, but I really, I'm very curious about the teenage Dave Gregory growing up in England during this explosion of popular music, which comes into what people have been calling psychedelia or psychedelic music. And you're in England while that's happening, right? So, so what is that like for, for a young person like you growing up at that time? Well, that's where I got hooked. Uh, and I think looking back, how very, very fortunate I was to have grown up in that period. I mean, I'm, I'm what am I now? I'm 68 now. So I, when the Beatles broke, I was 10 years old. So they were the soundtrack to my school years and all the bands that followed through in the wake of the Beatles. It's amazing pop and beat music, even pre psychedelia. You know, I was completely hooked on it. I couldn't ignore it. Uh, I always had a love of music that was sort of bequeathed to me through my parents who, who weren't professional musicians by any means, but they just had love for classical music. There was always music in the house and, uh, you know, so, so and, and the Beatles became part of the house music. Just going to school, uh, there was pirate radio, not the sort of pirate radio there is nowadays. It, 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 these were pop addicts. Who were, who were moored offshore, who were not happy about the playlist system at the BBC and would play the records they wanted to play. I think there was quite a lot of um, bribery involved as well yeah. <laughs> from various record companies, the smaller labels, certainly. But it's great, you know, you could tune into these stations and it was really, you know, medium wave band, offshore radio, I lived in Swindon, which is like 80 miles west of London, so reception wasn't that great most of the time. In the summer it was all right, but uh, if there was a storm at sea or a lot of fog, you, it was just static, you know. But something was coming through the mist. That was the intriguing thing. It was just, uh, you, you just get this sort of uh, fuzzy fuzzy impression of uh, this other wonderful world of music, pop music. It was a party going on out there. You just wanted to be part of it. Um, and like I say, well, I look back and think how lucky I was. But then again, you know, there weren't the options that for entertainment and home entertainment and amusement that there are today. We had three television channels, virtually no radio. The BBC was very um, staid and straight laced and you'd get maybe one or two pop shows a week and that would be it so uh, as i say pirate radio and uh, there was a little bit of television top of the pops and ready steady go they were the cool things to watch although top of the pops wasn't always very good but it was pop on tv that was near enough but it was just amazing and you know i couldn't really it's one of the reasons I think, or I've always cited it as being but why I'm an academic failure, because I wasn't really able to concentrate on my school studies. Music was just too much of a distraction. 
and I couldn't help it. You know, it was like I'd race home from school. First thing I'd do is turn on the radio and before my, my parents got back from work and uh, tuned into Radio London and just, just, to, just to get a, a buzz from whatever was happening in the other, you know, while I'd been at school, <laughs> this party was going on. Why aren't I part of it? And then eventually, um, you know, I had to get a guitar, I had to buy my own electric guitar. My folks didn't want to know about it, you know. I'd been sent off for piano lessons and that's where I was going to, I was going to sit at that piano for half an hour a day, whether I liked it or not. But uh, I had other ideas. I'd love to, to know some of the songs that were turning you on when this is starting to happen. Every Beatles single that ever was. But the one that really just uh, drove me nuts was the first time I heard Eleanor Rigby. Mm. Because suddenly, <laughs> you know, they were just leaps, uh, bounds, leaps and bounds of, ahead of everybody else. Every record, there was a whole slew of great pop singles around in the 60s. But nothing, you know, and then suddenly they, they just released this great paperback writer and rain. What a brilliant A and B side that was. And we, we all went nuts for that. The guitar sounds and the sort of that raga rock thing that rain had. That was just totally, uh, totally addictive. And then within weeks, um, the new Beatles single is about to be released. Tune in for a preview and suddenly you hear this string sextet and Paul McCartney and no other Beatles. It's the Beatles. They do a few backing vocals at the end of the song. It's still the Beatles. And it was just amazing. And I had never heard strings arranged like that or applied in a pop, uh, uh, in a pop situation and, and, it, and have it work so brilliantly. And uh, I, I just suddenly thought, yeah, Guitars are fine. I'm into cellos from now on. I just love the sound of the, the spiccato cellos, especially. And George Martin's arrangement was just peerless, absolutely perfect. Well, plus he's, he's for the first time, they're close miking the strings. So absolutely. That percussion, yeah. I wouldn't have realized that at the time. Yeah. All I knew was that it was just brand new and really exciting. Well, that whole album, uh, Revolver, I was three years old when it came out and my parents had it because they were music fans, not musicians. But we had Revolver in the home when I was three and four years old. And I remember it being a life changing experience for me as, as probably one of my earliest musical memories. There's so many things on that record that just are game changers. The, the backwards guitar stuff, obviously the full Indian track from Harrison. Uh, what were some of the other tunes on that record that you were enamored of? Uh, what, Dr. Robert, uh, And Your Bird Can Sing, with that beautiful two-part guitar thing that's impossible to play. <laughs> uh, uh, and Tomorrow Never Knows. I mean, that's really invented psychedelia I, I, I would say perhaps in terms of guitar players Jeff Beck invented it a year previously with over under sideways down all those yardbirds 45s Jeff started the psychedelic guitar sound that we recognize today but for sheer off the scale imagination tomorrow never knows was the big shift that was the seismic shift that uh, kicked off the whole psychedelic movement and uh, again, it was the, it was the raga, uh, and all these backward sounds spinning. In. How do they do that? <laughs> they they got this great melody and these weird lyrics, and then they've got all these production details. And you just thought, how in God's name is that possible? I knew nothing about recording techniques in those days. It was just a brilliant noise, as far as I was concerned. Years later, you, you still you realise how they did it, but even so. A lot of it was really random, and yet they, it all worked. You know, they were just spinning tapes in backwards and flying in little samples of uh, stuff on quarter-inch tape and what have you, and, and, and all these events occurred precisely the right moment to make a, a totally magical listening experience. Yeah, and they're manually bringing things in and out on the board. Um, you know who speaks also of uh, Tomorrow Never Knows as a breakthrough moment 
for him was uh, the guitarist Steve Hackett from Genesis. Yeah. Well, Steve, again, he's another great, well, we're, we're leaping forward now to, to, to the Genesis years. Well, let's, 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 get, let's get there let's, because, let's get there in a minute because I do want to dwell a little bit on this, this era. Yeah. Uh, how about uh, Their Majesty's uh, Satanic from, from the Stones? <laughs> uh, it was a, a while before I caught up with that record. Mm. Now the Stones, um, they had a, a their 1967 was a really bad year for them because two of them were, you know, Jagger and Richards were actually sent to prison. Mm. Uh, they weren't there very long, but they were made an example of by the um, establishment. Um, fortunately, they were they were released on appeal, and rightly so. But it must have. Uh, it must have had an effect on them. It meant that the, the momentum they'd been building up had to stop. Uh, and suddenly Beatles, who they'd always been in competition with, had just put Sergeant Peppers out. That was a huge act to follow. Uh, and for the Stones, you know, the, like I say, they, their work had stopped. What were they gonna do? Well, <laughs> We'll get stoned like the Beatles did. We'll go into the studio and see what happens. And so, uh, again, it's it's a psychedelic monument, but it's not one that I return to very often. It's a big. Uh, Andy Partridge loves it. It's ah. one of his pivotal albums. Well, and you know, two thousand kind of, light years from home. Yeah, that's a great song. That really is good. And I love the little Mellotron breakdown in the middle as well. It's really magical. You gotta have but another. Then there's child. stuff like <laughs> there's stuff like let's sing this all together, see what happens. Uh, stuff like that, and um, it was all fun, you know. But whether I would have felt comfortable paying thirty-seven and sixpence for it at the time, I, I think is unlikely. I've got a, an original mono pressing of it with the the three D uh, oh, yeah? beautiful thing. I found that a few years ago after years oh. of searching. Um, and, you know, I, I love it. Well, I guess I, I wanted to, to touch on how uh, this whole batch of groups that we could be included in this scenario, as you mentioned, the Yardbirds, uh, the Small Faces, perhaps, Pink Floyd. Uh, how much exposure are you getting to that stuff as a 15, 16 year old? As I say, most of it came through um, uh, Radio London, the pirate ship. Now, in the house, we didn't have TV until, I remember precisely when we got the TV, it was in March 1967. So up until that point, all the music that uh, I was aware of came through from, you know, a weekly pick of the pops programme on the BBC and the pirate radio sh stations. Then in March 67, I remember, you know, we were so excited, this black and white television first time <laughs> and uh, tuned in for On Top of the Pops. And it was an amazing show. It's the first time I'd seen Jimi Hendrix. I had Jeff Beck and Jimi Hendrix on the same program. And he was doing Purple Haze. And, and I just, I said, wow, who's this? Where, where, what? Again, mind blown. And uh, it, it was just one of, the, one of those magical moments. Um, that would have been, yes, that's right. That was, so that was, that, was, that, that was at the sort of in the spring of 67. So I suppose that's when I started being aware of music through television. And there were other TV shows as well that had music, uh, musical like chat shows and stuff. There was one called D Time. They would always have a band on playing at least one song and I can remember shortly afterwards seeing Cream they 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 showed up on there playing Strange Brew mm. and that was another magical moment as well so uh, yeah I would say 1967 generally spring through to the winter that that was a real um, game changer plus you know I was what 13 14 years old very important time for a young lad so all kinds of changes were happening. Mm. Did, did the kind of uh, hippie fashion and the imagery, did it make it into Swindon uh, when you were a teen? 
Oh yeah, not 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 in a big way. We didn't have um, you know we didn't have People's Park or we didn't have the you know the San Francisco Panhandle area and stuff like that. There was no great hippie gatherings, but there were trendy shops if you had the money. I mean, basically, it grew out of the mod scene. All the trendy shops sold mod clothes, which were very expensive. Kids used to find the money from somewhere. I don't know. I I never had the money, but occasionally. Um, you know, for birthdays and stuff, we'd get treated to a flowery shirt or a pair of um, corduroy elephant cord hipsters, a pair of which I actually wore in the Dukes of Stratosphere. I could still get into them. <laughs> oh, you can! Wow. <laughs> and, well, I could then. I don't think I can. Now. <laughs> so, you know, I'm also fascinated by. I mean, I should just say right in the open that uh, British music was huge for us in America. And I, I was experiencing these things uh, as a young person in my single digits in real time, uh, just due to family members and everyone being, you know, and also being outside of New York. Uh, and that moment where psychedelic music starts to switch over to what people call progressive rock. Yeah. The, what was the the moment for you is it in the court of the crimson king or what what is the 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 moment where you start to see the beginnings of progressive rock in england for me it was the nice uh, the original band that keith emerson uh, had with lee jackson and brian davison and he would do uh, rock interpretations of classical pieces like brandenburger which i think was their first single or one of the early singles i remember seeing them uh, or hearing them he was it's a little bit like um, I thought when well, he's doing an electric version of what Jacques Lussier trio were doing in the in the late 50s and early 60s from, from the French trio who, who were putting a beat behind these Bach preludes and what have you. So he did it with Bra the Bra one of the Brandenburg concertos, which I was familiar with through my dad because he was a huge Bach fan. He had a lot of, uh, in fact, I think one of the one of the records that was played a lot in the house were the Brandenburg Concerto. So I knew what this piece was, mm. never heard it rocked up. But from that point forward, I thought, oh, this is great. This is, who, who knew this was possible? Um, but really the first uh, progressive rock album that knocked me out pre-Pepper was um, uh, Are You Experienced, Jimi Hendrix. I, I couldn't believe how you could make a guitar behave the way he did. What music was he listening to? How did what sort of a life did he live hmm. to have thought up this stuff and even dreamt it was even possible to record? Because it's just stunning. Even today, I, I struggle to find out I, just to, just to think how on earth um, only, he had an upside down Stratocaster, a fuzz pedal, and whatever tape echo facilities they had at Delaney Lee Studios. I don't know. Magic, sheer talent imagination and magic that was a, a huge step forward so when pepper came out a couple of weeks later right. i loved the songs but i thought well the guitar playing is a bit lame <laughs> i remember thinking that these guys can't really listen to hendrix that's what he can do with the guitar i like the songs on sergeant pepper and i love the imagery and i love the gatefold sleeve and i love the uh, it, was, it was fantastic of course it was but to my teenage years, they were no great shakes as, in, as players. Well, Apart from McCartney's bass playing, I should mention that. He was always one of my favorite bass players. That Still comes is. across, yeah, certainly starting on Revolver, that comes across very clearly. Um, and you make a good point, too, about the roots of progressive rock music really do span back to Hendrix. They do. And, and Jeff Beck. And... You know, Jimmy has always, uh, one of the reasons he was persuaded to come to this country was that Chas Chandler promised to introduce him to Eric Clapton. So he'd been listening to Clapton a long time. It's like a, a mesh of Eric Clapton and Bob Dylan. Because of course, if you look at the hair, th that was the other thing about Hendrix. First time he, no, first thing he noticed about him was the hair. Nobody had hair like that in 67. And then you look at the cover of Blonde on Blonde, and you think that's actually, that's Bob Dylan's hairstyle afroed up 
So, uh, and, and it later became apparent that Jimmy was a huge Bob Dylan fan. And again, you see, this is the other thing that's unrelated about Hendrix. He was a great poet. It was those early songs, the lyrical imagery, just the imagination and the way it fit perfectly with what he's expressing it on the guitar. Mm. It was, it was just uh, extraordinary. And uh, it's, he's still probably the most um, consummate rock star of all time yeah i think that's fair um so did did you get to see any live music around that time uh my first live concert would have been um it was a package tour headlined by the who november 1968 and uh i was i just turned 16 so very very impressionable and really <laughs> buzzing with just the whole vibe of everything. And finally we got to see one of my favorite bands live. And it was a great show. I mean, it was uh, The Who, uh, The Crazy World of Arthur Brown. It was a group called The Mind Benders who'd been reformed and it actually turned out to be half of what later became 10CC. Uh, then there was a group called Gracious who were one of those lost prog bands who almost but never quite made it. And there was a band who opened up, I think they called the Alan Bowne. He was a trumpet player and he had a singer called Jess Roden who went on to do something, uh, some other stuff with um, in the 70s. So it was a, a good package. But much as I loved The Who, and they were fantastic, stars of the show were the crazy world of Arthur Brown. That was a brilliant live band to a 16 year old. And it was the first time I'd actually seen a strobe light in action. Ah. There was a part of the show, Arthur, who's stick thin, he came on with, he had this, you know, the fire helmet. So he'd come on with his hair on fire. Uh, and then um, I think he was pretty much stripped to the waist. He was thin as, thin as a stick insect and very, very animated. And the band, it's just a three piece band, Vincent Crane on Hammond organ, bass player, I think his name was Nick Greenwood. Drummer was this little kid. He was just a teenage lad. He held the sticks properly, but he was getting such power out of this little kid of drums. Oh, who's this? He's my age. Years later, of course, I discovered it was Carl Palmer. So live, they were immense. And I remember that at one point uh, he did this sort of daft, loony dance with just the strobe the stage lights went out just the strobe light on arthur dancing around it just looked like some bizarre dance macabre uh, it, it was really mesmerizing and i nearly fell off my chair just watching it but for me having seen crazy world of arthur because they broke up a few months later it was a terrible shame because they, they i think they had uh, great promise and they had you know Pete Townsend's tutelage as well. He produced them and kind of signed them to track records. And he was very much uh, one of their mentor. But for whatever reason, the band broke up. But I, it, it was a great show and, and again, turned, out, turned my head. It's also the first time I'd seen a proper PA system. And I remember they didn't have any, uh, you know, today you'll get someone on the on front of house desk will have a, a cassette player or something or other with some music gently playing in the background while the stage was being set. No, they just, uh, these things just hissed. And you could hear this potential, it just fore, fore, foretold of, you know, loud noises coming from that, those two stacks that were hissing away gently while the, the whose road is set the stage. You just knew your ears were in for a bat, battering. It, it was beginning it was to really drool. drool. Yeah. <laughs> it was drooling audio saliva. <laughs> That's exactly, exactly. Kissing must, with anticipation. Was it, uh, what was the venue, Dave? Colston Hall in Bristol. Oh, yeah. Which has now been destroyed and is being rebuilt. Um, but I've seen so many gigs there. It was, it's, it's been very controversial in recent years because um, Edward Colston was um, basically made all his money from the slave trade. And uh, he basically, you know, it was his business 
did more than anything to, to build the city of Bristol into the port that it became. But nowadays, that seems very, very uh, dodgy background. And the, I don't know if you heard about it in the States, but his statue a year or so ago was, um, was pulled off its pedestal and, and drunk, dumped in the harbour. And uh, it's, it caused a big hoo-ha and um, people, are, people are really upset that his name should still be associated with the city. Can't escape history, unfortunately. And steps are now being taken to rename that whole area where the Colston Hall used to be. Um, I'm sure when it's, it's, when it's due to reopen. Mm. But uh, certainly I, I've seen so many shows there and all of them have been fantastic. It's not a great sounding venue, but it, once you're in there, it's, it feels like home from home. You know, it's like, oh, yes, here we are. This is the fun palace. I actually know it well, Dave. I played there a number of times with a Canadian uh -huh. Genesis recreation called the Musical Box. Ah, yes, of course. So I was doing that for about six years uh, in the role of uh, Phil Collins. <laughs> oh, well, sooner you than me. Well, he's a great, uh, what, a, what a fantastic musician, I have to say. Uh, um, oh, yes. Now, <laughs> for my sins, one of my hobbies was uh, recreating some of my favorite songs from home on an eight track recorder just for the hell of it, you know? And one day I thought, I'm going to do Supper's Ready. Record that, I don't care how long it takes, I'm going to reproduce the drums, with my sequencer and the drum sampler. It took me, it took me months. but. <laughs> When I listened closely to Colin's work on uh, Apocalypse in 9-8. I wrote it out. Man alive. I thought this man is, uh, what was he, 21, 22 when he did that? If that. Come on. Yeah. If that. Early 20s and, and they, he was younger than them. That's right. Yes, I, could, I believe he was. Amazing. Yeah, that 9-8 is special, and I, I wrote it out as one of my first uh, chores to get ready to play that music accurately. And I could send you that. You well get done. a kick out of it. Um, well <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, so when do you uh, first get into Genesis? I got into Genesis. So I used to, well, with, yes, let me see now. 1971, I used to tune into um, BBC in the evenings, had this... Uh, a thread called the sounds of the 70s and okay. Bob Harris was so uh, still broadcasting today he had a show that was on twice a week and I would always listen to Bob because he always had good taste he always played the right things and he also had live bands in who'd come in and do live session at Maida Vale Studios and they'd have these uh, session um, session tapes and they were always really he, he always I, you know, put a good compilation of stuff together. And one day he, um, I'd heard, I'd read about Genesis. I'd never heard them. I used to get the Weekly Inky magazines, but they were always in there, or not always, but they'd started to create a buzz. So one day uh, Bob Harris played Harold the Barrel. Uh, and it was, and I just thought, oh, th was, this is Genesis then. Oh, wow, this sounds really interesting. I, I'm going to have to check them out. Well, I didn't really have the money at the time to go just willy-nilly buying records every week the way I do now. <laughs> but uh, actually, I don't. But I did at one time. Anyway, it was a while before I came back to Genesis. And then a year later, Foxtrot came out and it got rave reviews in the papers. And I remember, I thought, I've got, to, I've got to find out more about this group. And I'd gone into town, I took my driving test, and I passed my driving test. I was feeling really pleased with myself that I'm going to treat myself to an album. So I went to the local record shop on my way home, picked it up, and brought it back. And uh, I mean, instantly, from that fir those first Mellotron chords of uh, Watcher of the Skies, from that point forward, I was addicted and I played it and played it and played it. So really it was, I, I, I'd heard, as I say, Harold the Barrel and uh, a year later, a Foxtrot and that was, that was my introduction. And I, I've stayed with them ever since. 
Those first two, man, I mean, they're so special. Nursery Crime, Foxtrot. Yeah. What about Trespass? Because that's 50 years old this month, or last month, I should say. Well, I do. I feel it's a beginning. It's a beginning. Well, it's a, it's a kind of a sophomore because the beginning was a Decca record that they did with Jonathan King. Well, my understanding was that that was a, a demo, though. It was, yeah. Didn't stop from putting it out. Yeah. And um, I've listened to it recently. Uh, it's not bad. Uh, for a bunch of kids, it's really got some very uh, interesting things. Um, That's Me is one of my favourite B-sides. It's a really great song. Yeah. But, yeah, it's not, it's not the... It's it's not it's not the greatest record, but it was okay for 1969, and then Traspas again, like you say, a beginning. Were it not for the knife, I think it would have been a bit of a letdown. The knife saved it. For yeah, me. but then the knife comes to life when it's Hackett and and uh, Collins. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The lineup changed for the better. Yeah, I mean they they said as much, and you know they needed that uh, power from a drummer and a chameleon guitarist who, you know, who was aware of uh, Fripp and the Mellotron and all of these things. Um, yeah, so I mean, I feel like that's the, kind of the beginning for me when Hackett and, and, and Collins come on and, and all that writing starts uh, on, on Nursery Crime. Did you have any uh, notice or affinity for Anthony Phillips in Genesis? I found out about him later. But for me, the guitarist was always Steve Hackett, you know, because I didn't actually hear Trespass for some years. Um, uh, that was one that I, I went back to many years later. I know that he's, um, he's hailed as, you know, the, the genesis of Genesis, one of the most important founding members, because he was the one that did most of the early writing. Um, and in fact, I had an opportunity to meet him because he showed up at a big, big train gig. Uh, the last one we did a year ago, he was in the audience, but I never got to get to meet him. I'd have been a bit embarrassed to meet him because I don't know enough about his work or his solo work, even though a big, big train did a cover of one of his songs uh, some years ago. Master of Time. That's right. Um, I need to listen to that again because I, I've forgotten pretty much everything about it. I'm ashamed to say. So how is Hackett figure into your, your world? He was completely different from any other guitar player I'd ever heard. And it was like he is playing, at least on Foxtrot, I felt was, it was, it was kind of um, designed for the band. In other words, you didn't hear very much of, apart from possibly Horizons, you didn't really get the essence of what, who Steve Hackett was as a musician. He was part of the Genesis whole. Um, and I think he did it really, really well. He fitted in, he had some fairly <laughs> basic and crude fuzz sounds that were, that were, okay, that were that worked, you know? And, and it, it wasn't like he was, um, he, he, he didn't go off on any huge, um, you know, they, he wasn't allowed to go to solo for very long or right. go off on any big EO trips. But I, I felt that as a band member, he, he was, there was nobody better. Well, plus then you have the, the 312 strings going on at that time. That's right. That was a lovely sound. I think Anthony Phillips was responsible for coming up with that in the first place, him and, and, and Mike Rutherford between them. Mm. Um, I think they, uh, they developed that between them. And then, of course, uh, Tony Banks picked up the guitar and then, and then Hackett as well. But I saw Genesis at the Bristol Hippodrome on the, um, on the Selling England tour. And they were really... Um, just really dynamic and, and bri quite brilliant. There was very little stagecraft. Uh, I seem to remember they were all sitting down, apart from Peter, and they, um, and, and they just delivered the record, really. And then there were inter interludes where they had to retune the, the 12 strings, yeah. and t Peter would tell a story and a few jokes. Um, uh, they, it was really, really enjoyable. And again, a, a, another band I was really, really glad to have seen in their prime. Did you see the lamb? No. 
No, I, I, I don't know why I missed that. It was possibly because they didn't play. I'm not sure. Did they play in, in, in Bristol? I can't remember. I don't know. It may be that at the time I was busy gigging with, um, at the time I was with a country and western band. I was learning to, um, yeah, I was doing gigs. I mean, I've been sitting at home doing nothing. And finally I, I was in the band that I was actually getting booked. At the time I wasn't that bothered about the style of the music. It was great to be out playing with people who were, you know, good friends and a good laugh. So it's quite possible if they if if the Lamb tour did come to Bristol, I, I would have been busy elsewhere. <laughs> I don't know. Was I missed a... Steely Dan's first tour as a result of that. I've never forgiven myself. Yeah, I'd heard that you're a big Steely Dan fan. Oh yes. My favorite is a Royal Scam. Mm hmm. Good album. My favorite is and always will be Countdown to Ecstasy. I can't think of a better band. Every musician just locking perfectly together with these, these amazing songs. Yeah. The lyrics. The lyrics. Just, uh, coolest lyric writing of all time and just, just brilliant musicianship and production and everything. And uh, I never get tired. I must have played that record a thousand times and I never get tired of it. Yeah, I've gone on to to make sure that I had all of the Fagan solo stuff because I feel like that's just extending the whole concept of that band, you know. Yes. And I, and I think yeah, more... the um, sorry, the Nightfly was uh, a real that was a treat, wasn't it? After Steely Dan having disappeared for such a long time, and then Donald comes up with an album that's that good. That's really great. Oh, it's still that good. I mean, that's another one. Just holds up yeah um are, are we neglecting I, I i'm wondering if uh, steve howe was important for you oh yeah very much so yes as a band were important i saw them twice and i saw the original lineup with peter banks i mean he was a hero to me yeah i loved again like hackett he had his own style he didn't he wasn't a blues man he was a pop guitarist who was you know, thinking outside the box. He had a lot of fairly crude and rudimentary sounds. I mean, you played a Rickenbacker, for goodness sake. You know, you're not going to be cutting loose on one of those in a prog band, really. And yet, that was his style. And it was great. I loved the first album. And I loved Bill Bruford's playing on that. And I think that, you know, there was something about the drums and the guitar on that record. And Chris Squire's bass as well. Uh, just... Um, brand new, fresh, and just full of promise. You just couldn't wait for the next record. So time and a word, that didn't disappoint me in the slightest. It was just as good. So when he, uh, when he quit or he was fired or whatever happened to him, I was astonished. I thought, what are they doing? And why are they getting rid of the guitar player? <laughs> and then Steve Howe arrives. Oh, that's what I see. That's the reason he went. So yeah, Steve Howe, Another real individual who's never changed his sound radically. And he's one of those players that didn't rely on cliches. You wouldn't get him cutting loose on a, a long extended blues solo, unless it was something like their cover of America, which is all sort of written. He probably improvised it, but it sounds like it's a written solo. And it's different from anybody else out there. He just, Guitar players have a lot of tricks that they use, you know, they always fall back on tricks and their favourite um, little party pieces and so on. Steve Howe didn't, never did that. If you wanted to play like Steve Howe, you had to really, really learn how to play the guitar. And uh, I've always admired his musicianship and his skill, his just sheer skill. And, and again, you know, he <laughs> plays this Gibson jazz guitar. <laughs> With the bridge pickup to make it sound a bit rockier than it needs that it was designed to be and i loved that and he stuck stuck with that all these years just brilliant what a player i mean i thought i would ask you about him because you know between him and 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 hackett and uh even fripp i i feel like the the roots of guitar arranging 
that would be so important to you and, and the guys, you know, that's starting to happen where it's, it's not, it's not as much about guitar um, hero as much as maybe it's guitar uh, in the ensemble and also uh, guitar parts, which I know you're, you're very fond of. So, um, I mean, was, was how there for you in terms of how he would arrange or orchestrate? He was, but particularly when I got involved with Big Big Train, then I started to think more and more, you know, what would Steve Howe have done here? And I can hear now, uh, there are a few, there's a few songs that I can listen to. Um, I actually, I really need to go back and have a listen, because it was 11 years I was with that band. Yeah. And a lot of the early stuff, it all went by so quickly, I've, I've virtually forgotten about. But I do remember thinking from time to time, um, right, for these next four bars, I'm going to do Steve Howe, <laughs> uh, whatever it was. So, yeah, he was very influential and he would, he would, have, ins he would have inspired my thinking in, in many places, certainly in the big, big train years, not so much in XTC. But did you know him as uh, the guitarist on My White Bicycle? Yes. Oh, yes. And I've since bought the Bodast album and uh, Keith West Tomorrow. Uh, the Tomorrow album was one of Andy's favourites. And uh, there's no mistaking who it is playing. It's, uh, he, he has, it's, that's him. Yeah. He is and always has been. But going back to what you were saying about... Um, uh, parts guitar parts as distinct from okay now it's your turn to bat off you go see what you can come up with you, I've, i kind of grew out of that as a, a sort of after after i joined xdc in fact andy was dead against these extended workouts he wasn't having any of that if you're going to play a solo make it fit the song and so uh, it was never he never sort of um, he never bullied me about it but it was like an unwritten law and got me into thinking about how is this, how can I best enhance this song or at least not mess it up? Um, what would the guitar, what would be a good thing for a guitar to play at this point to take this song to another level? Just, just even, even only, if only for 30 seconds. Well, were uh, there, uh, were there any loose parts in an XDC live performance? It seemed to me like there was, when you came on, Battery Brides kind of had an opening duet thing between you and, and Andy, is that correct? Yes, yes. In fact, there was a long instrumental section in the middle, as well as at the start. <laughs> and it used to drive me nuts sometimes because uh, that was recorded originally with Barry Andrews on keyboards. Yes. And he had this sort of oscillating um, organ thing that went, that was sort of formed this mechanical background background effect well i had to somehow reproduce that on guitar and i'd figured out of just playing a bunch of um d's and g's sort of a, a sort of random high thing but i put it through um, a roland jc 120 with a vibrato chorus effect on so it sounded kind of you know a little bit but anyway after i've been you know and andy would start and it would depend on what sort of mood he was in how long it would take him to get to the actual song itself. And sometimes it would go on for five minutes and my thumb would be just, come on, will you just start this song so I can change this chord? It used to cripple my thumb. And uh, then again, so finally when the, when the song started, we could hit the big open G chord. I could breathe a sigh of relief, but I swear I used to do it deliberately. <laughs> and then in the middle there would be this other solo similar to the to the intro as well where the where the machines would take over right some nights it was really magical i used to really enjoy it but if if you if if we weren't in the zone it was really not fun was that the only sort of open-ended part of the show for you guys uh, i'm trying to think i just there was um well scissor man we had uh, yeah now scissor man could be a lot of fun the end section which later became known as cut it out uh that was something that was a studio experiment of, on drums and wires where we were just messing around with a bunch of um 
digital delays and stuff and doing a kind of a dub mix because that was something else that Andy was big on the Jamaican uh, dub style of production where I think these uh, these tracks or these versions would be released with the uh, bits poked in and out and stuff appearing and disappearing at random intervals so we thought we'd do a we'll have a bit of that for the fade out of scissor man and then we took it onto the stage and had a bit of fun with it there that wasn't so bad that was it was quite, that worked quite well it was quite exciting actually well i have to say since i have you here dave gregory xtc on stage truly one of the great live bands of all time fucking amazing and i just have to say that to you face to face across the digital divide here well thank you xdc live nothing nothing more powerful nothing more inventive nothing more nimble nothing more fun uh the the joy and and the 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 just the outpouring of energy that would come out of that band on stage and if you haven't seen the footage, please go onto YouTube, everyone, and, and just see what this band was like live. Because you may know their studio recordings, but this band on live was a killer and, and had to be dealt with. And I will also go on record as saying it needs to be reassessed just how great XDC was live. And uh, I mean, I can go on, Dave, but I, I just want to throw to you, that must have been such a fun live gig for you. It was at the time. I've heard some live recordings since, uh, and while not the best quality you'll ever hear, I was astonished at the energy and the speed at which we took everything. Uh, I couldn't do it today. I swear to God, it would it would kill me. It's a young man's band. Very much so, and we used to sweat quite literally sweat buckets. Uh, well, not literally buckets. We actually sweat a whole lot oh, it's a and uh, it's now when i'm if i start to break a sweat when i'm on stage i'm thinking oh is me towel you know oh, i don't know about this back then yeah we were we were just um just powered by the sound of everything and full of our own energy it was just um yeah we were we were very very energetic and i think proud of the uh the, the music we were making we knew that it wasn't the highest of five, but we we also knew that uh, if it didn't if it didn't leave an effect on you, uh, there must be something wrong with you. you. Your pulse must have stopped or something. There was definitely um, it was an, it was an energy overload. We'd like to think we could be passed on to our audience, and uh, I know when when. It was difficult when we first went to the States because they were suspicious of a British new wave band for the early months of 1980. By the end of that tour, we made a lot of friends and um, people perhaps reassessing this old punk thing that was coming over from England that nobody really wanted. Um, but yeah, no, we, we, we had a lot of fun. While it was fun, it was fun. But of course, times change. And uh, he, well, I don't want to go over the the, the Andy breakdown. No, but 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 the fact of the matter is, and it, uh, that what live bands are able to com to keep up with XTC around that period, and just what it must have meant for the police to follow that. So you guys are on a bill with the police, mm -hmm. and you're you know I I've seen shows on on youtube where you guys are hitting the stage with beat town and right. it's faster than the record and it's it's pushing like a motherfucker and i'm thinking geez this is where they start <laughs> yeah it's it is it's it's astonishing i was um i i don't know how we did it <laughs> but we didn't um you know at the time we were i think we were just desperate not to fail i think that was it it wasn't so much we were on a, a mission but we just didn't want to lose face in front of a big audience regardless of who they'd come to see so we just um we just kept pow 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 uh until and um, until <laughs> until this the 40 minutes was up <laughs> but the police you mentioned 
I remember the first time we played with them, it was in Buffalo, New York. Uh, we'd come over, we were doing some club dates and then the management said, well, we're lucky guys, you know, we've got you a support slot with the police. And we thought, oh, well, that's okay. Then they're, they're not a problem for us. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't, we'd never seen them play live. Didn't know what they, we just heard the records. We heard Roxanne. Uh, and we'd heard a few other things, but we, we didn't really know anything about them beyond the singles that we'd heard on the radio. So we did this, uh, we, did our, we did our set. We thought, okay, well, let's, let's, let's watch the main, the main act. Let's see the talent. Yeah. And, uh, oh, my goodness, these guys are really fucking good. Mm. What were we thinking? They were absolutely way, way better than I ever imagined. So we had big respect for them from that point forward, all of us. So we were more than honored to uh, warm the stage up for them. And because we went back later in the year and did a, a, few, a bunch more dates. And we'd, oh, we did a, a little summer trip as well over in France and, and Europe, which was a lot of fun. But again, it was like a package, a package tour that they were headlining. But make no mistake, at least with big boots, and uh, I have nothing but respect for them. Did, did you have contact with Andy Summers? Uh, a little bit, yeah. He was okay. <laughs> he could be a bit moody, but he was okay. I, I kind of, um, I, I remember going guitar shopping with him once. We were in Austin, Texas, and he bought, I bought a guitar. He bought a, he, he bought a bunch of guitars, of course, mm -hmm. and um, but I never, I never kept in touch with him, but uh, yeah, I got, I got on okay with Andy. And I remember playing, um, playing Scrabble with Sting. Mm. And um, it was a fairly even match up to one point when uh, he came up with this word and uh, this was on the tour bus. Uh, he came up with a word and I thought, oh, that's, that's not right, is it? Do you want to challenge me, Gregs? No, uh, I don't know. No, I don't think, well, okay. No, you, you used to be a teacher, you know. Okay, fair enough. So he, he laid this word down and uh, that's what lost me the game because I don't think it was a legal word. He convinced me that he was right. Well, you were convincing people all over with that live band. And, and uh, you know, to this day, I, I just, I, I was recently listening to the live BBC of uh, Optimism's Flame. And yeah. it occurred to me that at no point is anyone playing the same line as anybody else in that one. <laughs> that's one of those songs that's in three separate keys. One of Andy's favorites. I love the, I love the little groove though, the rhythm. I think Terry oh, Chambers yes. was made a master, played like a master on that. Mm. Uh, his, his drumming is, uh, is, is absolutely spot on. Um, and yeah, no, it's always a, a, a lot of energy, uh, a good source of energy. Well, and, and your part is completely independent from Andy's part. And the, the amount of, uh, well, I would call it hocketing, but the amount of you're playing on on beats, he's playing on off beats, and it's just so three dimensional. And it's just back and forth, rapid fire, and every note is in its place, and it's grooving like motherfucker. And you know that to me, I only saw another group do that much complexity and groove at the same time when I saw Gentle Giant. Ah, yes. Well, that's interesting. And I will say that it's, certainly... it's, a, it's the same thing. Nobody's playing the same part as anybody else, so it's four or five individual lines, and yet feels great straight down the middle grooving and, and sounding great and and uh and still it's a song that you can hum or a song you can enjoy and yeah. to me that's a real feat uh, i don't know that people appreciate how hard that would be to do live well, every night we we had this one in rehearsal andy and i would sit and figure out little guitar exchanges so you know, we did away with the concept of lead guitar, rhythm guitar. It's two guitar players working on a song. And uh, we would work out what was, what was working and what wasn't before we went into the studio. Same with all the songs. Everything was thoroughly rehearsed. Didn't take any chances. 
it would change often in the studio. But before we went in, we'd be properly, we knew what we were meant to be doing. And so, uh, yeah, that, that was, it, I think as much as, any, as anything else, it's about wanting to make sure that your contribution made a difference. So in other words, I wasn't necessarily going to be supporting Andy's guitar. I was going to be joining in with it and we were going to be bouncing off each other. So we both had, a, 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 you know, an equal role to play. Either one of those roles, if, if it was missing, the song would fail. That was basically my thinking. So whatever I did, it would have to be, uh, you know, it would have to count. So that's, that was basically you know, the, the, yeah, the simplest way of putting it, I suppose. But going back to Gentle Giant, I made a point of listening. I have, a, have one of their albums. I need to buy more of them. I only have three friends. And I was listening to it and thinking, yeah, well, this is a great album. Why don't I check this band out? Because they've got loads of stuff that I should really be listening to. Um, but it's... They, they did only have one guitar player, didn't they? It's this Gary Green, who incidentally turned 70 today. Oh, happy birthday, just Gary, out of Green, interest. Gary Green. Yeah. yeah. Right. I just wrote it. I've got a calendar. I do a calendar every year. Um, it's basically guitar portraits and then a calendar. And I've got births and deaths of, music, of guitar players mainly on the, in, the, in the panels. And I noticed with some interest that Gary Green's birthday was... Um, today in 1950 so there he is happy birthday gary happy birthday gary green and and the great gentle giant work that he did is is legendary and and there were multiple guitar arrangements even live when when ray shulman would pick up the guitar um, oh yeah you know that and then of course uh everyone was playing multiple instruments but i i just found it fascinating that they got they reached as many people as they did, say even as an opening act for Sabbath or Tull, but that they had a rock band that was playing sort of like a chamber ensemble, but still had the balls of a rock band. Um, and, and so, you know, having tried to play the XTC stuff as a trio with Mike Keneally and, and Doug Lunn, it doesn't work without that fourth part. And the way that you and Andy would lock in and the way that, that uh, Terry and Colin would lock in. So there's these layers going on. And I find like that, yeah, it was, it was a pop music experience. You know, you could dance. Were people dancing when you guys would play? So, yeah, sometimes, occasionally. Um, yeah, and, and again, going back to this interlocking thing, everybody, I'm thinking back, like, yeah, everyone was determined that um, their part was important. That was the thing that everyone, everyone was proud of what they brought to the table. That was the thing in the early days. And um, it's coming back to me now, this sort of, it was never expressed verbally or anything, but you could tell egos were keen not to be, you know, ridiculed or, or sent packing for any reason at all. So we all were determined that, as I said earlier, all, all the parts. Uh, again, you know, Colin Moulding's bass playing, which is an underrated oh. element in the XTC sound. I think oh, people yeah. are starting to listen to it more now, but certainly back in the day, I, he might have been a bit frustrated that his bass playing wasn't recognised. Well, I have to tell you, Dave, I, I do what I can on the university level. And in my course load, my curricula that I've developed, I make a very strong point in my arranging class, my production studio class, and my songwriting class to talk about, I'm so happy to have you on the record saying this, hey, everybody's part is important, you know? And so in my studio class, we listen to that bass sound and I say to them, do you realize how huge the bass part is in this song? Because they did. And that's why it's recorded this way. And that's why it's mixed this way. And that's why things are doubled. And that's why things are produced this way. And so XCC has definitely taken a very strong place in my passing on this idea of what, what is it you're trying to do when you're producing a song? Are, do you want to give, you know, I'll tell you another thing. When, when I've done these interviews 
for Yale Oral History of American Music, I spoke with uh, Quincy Jones. And he's such an interesting composer and arranger. And just out of the blue, he said to me, I always try to give people four or five things to listen to at the same time. And it's just so interesting to me because that's really what you guys were doing. I'm listening to, to Optimism's Flame or Beat Town and I'm thinking, well, this is certainly a rocker, but it's also so much interesting interplay between all of the parts. And then there'd be like conceptual uh, consistencies that I would say, that I would point out like the, the number three in the groupings of all the different rhythms of Optimism's Flame. And, and so there's even a part where you, I think it's in the whoa, 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 whoa part where you're sort of playing one, two, three, Andy, two, three, ba, two, right. And then it comes down to, there's a transitional riff in there where you're playing fast groups of three to go. Dilla, 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 dilla. So, you know, when you see that kind of follow through Dave, as a composer, as an arranger, and as an educator, you know, this is why I say, XTC had set a gold standard and that, that that's important because if you like intelligent rocking, whether it be Rush or Mahavishnu or Gentle Giant, whatever it is, XTC, you know, this is a kind of music making that exalts the common and makes it oh. less common, you know. And Chris Squire and, 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 uh, and Alan Holdsworth said something that I found very interesting that they both said it in totally different, con well, to totally different settings, but they wanted to do something less ordinary. Yeah, they certainly did that. Good Lord. But you see what I mean in terms of, you know, when you, when you love something like we do love music, I feel like it's, you kind of owe it to the music to, to A, put something of yourself into it, but B, also kind of push the, the boundaries, the walls a little bit and, and make things beautiful in your, in your little world that you're making there. And you guys did that, you know, uh, eight days to Sunday and all the time. And, and those records, you know, there's a reason that we're still talking about drums and wires. And, you know, it's the 40th anniversary of Black Sea. And that record stands strongly on its two legs, plus the variety of you guys were getting into. And I think that's something that I, I, I preach as much as possible now is the variety idea, that you're not hitting people over the head with the same thing. And because, you know, pop music has become so limited. And, yeah. and we sort of look at a period where you guys were saying, no, it's, it's not limited. It's, it can be fun in all these different ways. Is that something you guys I, talked about? I think the fact that we never had a big, big hit single that we felt obliged to follow up gave us the freedom to experiment and try whatever was necessary to, to sell, sell the record. But, you know, listening to what you've just said about analysing the, uh, the music, certainly we wouldn't have put that depth of thought into it at the time. We were just following our instincts. Certainly, the breadth of, um, what's, the, what's the word? Well, you know, Andy, he, he, never, um, he never limited himself to any one particular style of writing. He would pick up whatever was, I mean, he's just, a, a, he's like a lightning conductor for any number of brilliant art, artful things. Not just music. I mean, you should see some of his drawings and his painting and his. I have. Yeah. And his uh, sense of humor. Uh, he's just a super intelligent guy with a really open mind and just a brilliant way of expressing himself. And um, so it's thanks to him. I mean, when you consider that the, uh, the, the first XTC issue recorded thing was this song Science Friction. October 1977, that's when that was recorded. And if you think, then you, you go and listen to something like Travels in Nihilon, which was written and recorded three years later. That's quite a big leap. And so he learned about uh, studio techniques and what was and what wasn't possible and what he could do 
uh, in a band format and, uh, and, and just wrote songs that we could all play and could play live and could perform live and just and then he saw the studio as being this great big playground slash uh, lab, science lab so you know you've got all of that the songs the raw material in this brilliant setting that somebody else was paying for that was that was uh, meat and drink to Andy so and and fortunately for all of us because of course he took us with him and like you say we made these records and this and we're still talking about them today but as I say we wouldn't have applied the amount of uh, analytical thought into what we were doing perhaps just, not but but the instincts were there and they were they were they were definitely exploited yeah no it's a lot of fun I, I you know from this distance now i can look back with fond memories even though we had our squabbles and fallings out and things were not always uh, very happy not, not a happy time and, and quite quite a worrying time and certainly during the late 80s but now um now the dust has settled and the stuff's there for all to see and hear. And, and, and I'm just astonished that it's still selling. We're still finding new audiences. Thank goodness, because it um, means that I haven't had to go out and look for a proper job. <laughs> well, right. And, and in fact, um, the, the, the music was built to last. I think that, uh, you know, People might know the hits, but the the depth of the programming and, and I wanted to talk about the 40th anniversary of Black Sea, September 12th, 1980. It was recorded during the summer and it was recorded at the townhouse. Now, that's such an interesting little just pocket of activity because so much music is is coming out around that time that is starting to move away from, first of all, in the drum department, cymbals are going away. So you mentioned Travels in Nylon, and I mean, that's, is that the first cymbal-less thing? Because I know around the same time, you're involved with Peter Gabriel's Melt album. Uh, you play on <laughs> I Don't Remember and Family Snapshot. And it's the yeah. same team, is it not? Same location, same team? Absolutely, same studio. And um, <clears throat> we didn't, uh, I don't think, I don't recall anyone saying, oh, we mustn't have symbols on this track. It was just like, uh, Andy was, uh, he's, a, he's a frustrated drummer. Drums are his thing. Clearly. And he uh, asked Terry if he could just hammer these tom-toms uh, for, 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 I don't know, just, he didn't want to make a loop. He wanted Terry to play. So Terry, well, Terry didn't do loops, right? No, I don't. Well, no, I don't think he. Well, the only loop I can remember him definitely doing was <laughs> a, a little tune called the Somnambulist, which showed up as a B-side when we were supposed to be doing a BBC session. Oh, and, uh, I want to talk about Somnambulist, but we'll wait, <laughs> we'll wait for a minute on that. Yeah, you yes, really okay. struck a nerve there. God, sorry. <laughs> but no. Uh, Ter we the stone room which i'm sure you've heard all about at the townhouse uh, it was a really really important uh acoustic environment thanks to hugh padgham's um uh, you know his, dis his accidental discovery of this talkback mic and the um uh and, the, and this gated reverb effect that became his trademark and Phil Collins exploited that and made it world famous, really, and everybody wanted the sound. Well, no self-control. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, my goodness me. A swarm of bees. That's just the most amazing drum break of all time. I just love that. Yeah, my son had not heard it, and when I played it for him, he said, it sounds like he's just shredding metal. <laughs> yeah. Incredible. And... I don't know why. I know Peter said that, uh, you know, he didn't want any metal work on the album because it takes up too much space, you know, a bit like a, you know, a tuned piano, like a piano, you put a piano on a track and the track's pretty much full, uh, you know, sonically. Cymbals, you've just got the, the upper edge of the piano, I suppose, the, the, the upper 
that side of the, the acoustic spectrum and he didn't but how why he thought that that was what he was going to replace it with that was never discussed but it doesn't seem like the record suffers as a result of not having any symbols on it we didn't uh, set out not to have symbols on tra travels in nihilon it's just they, they just weren't necessary and uh, we had this sort of ostinato guitar riff going all the way through the bass and the guitar playing in unison and um, this kind of odd Lydian, again, it was like a raga melody. And he came up with it, it was really spooky. And I just thought, oh, this is just, this is, this is going somewhere I want to go. <laughs> Next record, I want more of this. Because it's very, very prog, you know? Very. And I love that, in, in, in my mind, very much like a journey that you take with Revolver, because it starts with a pop tune, but man, if it doesn't end with a raga blowout at the end. <laughs> right? You have to own up, though, about the little uh, the waterfall at the end, which is supposed to sound like water pouring down a storm drain, but in fact is, um, was the townhouse shower curtain. And uh, it, was, it was, yeah, it sounded more like frying bacon. But never mind. I think the effect was there. But I, I show people uh, Travels in Neil on and, and I say to them, you know, look, man, this is proto-metal in 1980. Yeah, I suppose. This, yes, I guess. It, yeah. Music. Yeah. Well, maybe we were closet metal fans anyway. Were you? I, yeah, I, well, to a degree, yes. Yes, I you think so. I mean, I know Andy, Andy, I know for a fact that he loves... Uh, uh, Black Sabbath's second album, uh, Paranoid. Paranoid is awesome. Yeah. yeah, it's great. It is a good album. Uh, I just love the guitar sounds. Still trying to find that sound failing. Yeah, that, that's a moment. Um, were the heavy bands of interest to you, like Zeppelin and Purple? Very much so. Not so much Purple, but certainly Zeppelin. Um, you must have heard countless people saying yeah i bought that the week it came out yeah i've had it ever since yeah i actually bought it the day it came out on the strength of um a review that i read in beat instrumental which was a monthly magazine that i subscribed to on oh, my mum did and uh, i saw this review there's a, a review of one of their gigs and um they said you know the album's out in early april and uh, and the, the review of the gig was really glowing and there was a really cool picture of them on, on stage. I thought, I've got to check this band out. Uh, so I, I grabbed as much money as I could and went to Kemp's music shop and picked it up. And, uh, and I don't know why, I was just compelled to, to go to the shop and buy the record. And when I got it home, I realised why, you know, it's just astonishing. But of course it gave rise to a whole bunch of imitators. You, no, shut up. But I, I loved um, I, the guitar sounds, those big guitar sounds, even though listening to, to it today, they're not that huge compared with what some of the bands you're hearing today. At the time, yeah, it, was, uh, it certainly changed the game. And, well, uh, yeah, and isn't uh, Jimmy Page important for guitar arranging? Very much so. I think as, as a studio producer, someone who knew how to use a studio, how to get the best out of, a, out of the studio. The second album, I thought was absolutely astonishing. I still, a whole lot of love is played every day somewhere on the radio, but that is, a, what a production. What an absolutely brilliant production. And, to to uh, what degree, I, I'm curious, talking about um, Black Sea, Dave, uh, I'm curious to what degree, or even, you know, subsequently English settlement, to what degree Padgham is, is really hands-on with what you guys are arriving at in the studio? He was very, very important, as was Steve Lillywhite, I have to yeah. say. Let's not forget Steve. He's a very, very gifted guy, He's got great ears. He knows what will succeed and uh, he can spot a failure as well, but he's too polite to say, which, <laughs> which of which. You know, making plans for Nigel would not have been the hit that it was without Steve Lillywhite's uh, insistence on getting it right. 
he worked uh, he worked his nuts off to get that the way it is um but certainly yeah very very important guy and of course the work he did later with you two and with a whole bunch of other bands genesis he's, yeah, genesis as well yeah i mean he's been phenomenally successful and hugh um we did, i did a podcast a few months ago again just talking about the uh, anniversary of the album and hugh was involved oh. and he'd forgotten he said i was so busy at that in that period it's all just one big blur from drums and wires right through to uh police's um uh, ghost in the machine he said i can't pinpoint a date between those two events because it was just i was working non-stop i had to remind him of certain things like for example he'd started work on phil collins face value album before we started on black sea so they'd had a break i guess while phil was writing more songs i think that's probably what it was and uh, in the break he did the black sea album and then went back uh, to finish off phil's record well i was trying to figure out how the Gabriel sessions you did figure into the timeline of drums and wires, because those are recorded right around the same time. Are they not? Yeah. Well, what happened was we were working in the townhouse on drums and wires phone rang one day and it was someone from Peter's management asking to speak to Steve and Steve uh, said, Oh, I've just been asked if I'd be interested in producing Peter Gabriel's next album. I said, what? Say what? You've got to do that. Well, you know, I can think about it. You've got to do it. But he's Genesis, isn't he? I don't know. Yeah, he, he was Genesis. Never mind that. If you never make another album, Steve, please do this record. And if you need a guitar player, give me a call, won't you? It's a joke. So we finished at Drums and Wires. We went off on tour to Australia. Uh, when we came back, we had a British tour lined up. And... Um, we discovered that uh, Steve had, in fact, taken the, the Gabriel gig and it was going well. Virgin Records wanted a follow up single to Making Plans for Nigel. So they wanted a song from Drums and Wires remix. So they called Steve and said, uh, can you and the band get together and remix? Um, I think there were three songs they suggested. I can't remember what they were now. Anyway, we met up at DJM Studios in London uh, late in September, I think it was. And uh, Steve had a cassette of work in progress, Peter's album, and he played a little bit of The Intruder. He said, have a listen to this. He says, he doesn't want symbols on this record. Can't believe it, but in yet, listen to this. And he played a bit of Intruder. And we thought, yeah, that's, you made the right decision there, Steve. You were doing a great job. And then a few weeks later, the phone, my phone rang and uh, Eve said, Dave, we need some guitar on this song. We're having some trouble. Could you, could you, have you got time to, have I got time? So I went to the studios. I remember the date, October the 16th, 1979. And um, I don't remember was in progress and we had to, uh, I, you know, Peter explained what he wanted. He wanted this big chiming guitar with a lot of sustain on it. Open chord. I said, well, if you want that chord, I'm going to have to work on an open tuning because it's impossible to play. So he showed me what the notes were on the piano and I retuned the guitar <laughs> yeah. to, to the chord. A, a bang. And um, it was bizarre tuning you ever. I've got it written down somewhere. I've forgotten exactly what it is. Oh, wow. Anyway, that did the trick. And... Um, we had spent a very uh, interesting afternoon be working with uh, one of my all-time heroes and, and just being totally, you know, frazzled with nerves in the company of someone who's been, you know, at, at the utmost respect for and been a fan of for years. And I was just thinking back at the time, thinking, what, what, six, seven months ago, I was driving a van around Bristol delivering mail order and now I'm, here I am and I've got to do Top of the Pops tomorrow. For making plans for another how did this happen mm. it was a pretty magical time for me did gabriel let you do what you wanted on, on family snapshot or was he giving you ideas there uh he 
he he specified he just he says i just want some sort of chunky rhythm guitar in these places here um he uh, and we tried a couple of guitars and eventually we settled we went back to the stratocaster because of this sort of you know nice chunky junk 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 the bridge pickup through a little music man amplifier that they had at the studio music um, 21065, a lovely little amp, really nice amp. And that was in regular tuning, of course. There weren't, there weren't too many complications with that. But I, it was just, um, I wrote the chords out. It didn't take long. We didn't spend very long on that. But I don't remember we did. I think I may have had to double, double track the, the guitar and I don't remember. And of course, the, the don't, the, the chorus of that song is in regular tuning and I played on it on, on a different guitar. So that, that's why it took a bit longer. Plus sitting in the pocket with Tony Levin and uh, Jerry Marotta, that was a joy. Hearing those guys in headphones, I thought, I can't, I, I'm going to ruin this. I'm going to ruin it. But that's a moment I'll never forget, hearing, hearing the, the stick and the drums together for the first time, close up. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an incredible sound. And, and that sound extends to music by other bands around that period. And, and, and I'm very interested in, I noticed that you work with Richard Barbieri. And I, I don't know that, that there's anything there there, but I, I was kind of find it interesting that at the time of the late 70s, early 80s, you have XTC sharing the label with Japan the band Japan with Richard Barbieri, David Sylvian, Steve Jansen, and Mick Karn. Um, mm -hmm. And also Captain Beefheart is on the label at that time with uh, Ice Cream for Crow and, uh, and Doc at the Radar Doc Station. Doc at the Radar Station, yeah. You know, um, and then Kate Bush is putting out The Dreaming and, and she has no symbols on that album. And it's just sort of, I, I wondered if people had really started listening to world music that had a lot of really interesting drumming and and certainly peter was very involved with world music with with uh, his real world stuff was that something that was in the air because i know you you said that there wasn't a mention of don't use symbols but was there a mention of sort of building these things up like in no self-control where you have marimba parts and all of this kind of stuff even japan with marimba parts and and all this world percussion mm. Uh, it's something that I think um, Andy would probably better to ask answering that that point because I don't really remember there being no there was no insistence on well they've done it this way so let's um, let's follow their example no that was never in fact quite the reverse I think Andy um, there was even a slightest risk of being accused of copying anybody Andy would drop it like a hot potato um it wasn't you know it wasn't really part of the agenda it's interesting that um like you say without the symbols it does free up a lot of those upper frequencies for other instruments and you can hear everything else on the well, not only just the instruments in that sonics area but you can hear better i suppose uh everything else that's going on on the track don't forget Lyrics. that Japan at that time were not really, uh, they, they weren't really a hard rocking band. <laughs> you couldn't really dance to Japan. And so the textures were very nuanced and very um, um, specific, very, very, very ear friendly. And a lot of it was low key. Didn't really require the excitement of symbols. So uh, their music probably, it would have, you know it, that was that was this kind of music they were making at the time in fact it was the tin drum album that uh, led us steve nye to produce the mama record which we went to after after english settlement and he was a big fan of in fact we all were a big fan of tin drum like the production of it it was it was so different from everything else you know and being um as i say low key not especially exciting quote unquote but nonetheless, very classy and very, very, very pleasant listening experience. Well, very atmospheric. Yeah, exactly. That's the word. So were, do you guys have any contact with them around that time? 
not at the time. I didn't meet Richard until I was working with Steve Hogarth. Uh, we were, uh, I'd done an album with him uh, that Craig Leon produced. This was in 1996. And uh, he'd invited Richard along to, to do some keyboard work on it. And that's how we, we got to know each other. And then when, when, I, when Steve put the, the H band together, Richard was part of that. He's a delightful chap. I love him. He's a really nice guy. And again, a very individual musician who doesn't follow any rules. He doesn't, it's not like you can learn to play like Richard Barbieri. Richard does, Richard is who, what Richard does. And it's great. I mean, he, he's never changed. He's really, a really individual, unique musician. And I've got a lot of respect for him, both as a, a human being and as a, and as a musician. Were, were you and Andy and the guys fans of Kate Bush's work? It, yes, I, I certainly was. Um, I noticed that it's now 40 years since Never Forever came out, which is my favorite of her albums. But I was listening to the first uh, side of it the other, other day and thinking, um, this is absolutely faultless. I can't find a single fault with this record, the songwriting, yeah. production, the singing, everything about it is just perfect. And though she, um, you know, went on and did her own thing a lot more, you know, self-producing her own stuff, there was a lot of interesting music that followed. I don't think as a, as a consummate whole, she ever bettered that one. I, I think that's... Uh, that's the high watermark of her, her writing and production career. Well, that's my Pelias. It has uh, oh. uh, Egypt. Yes. Oh, it has um, <laughs> even Babushka. What a great song. What a great song. And that's early Fairlight stuff, too. Yeah. That was, the, that was a big toy at the time, wasn't it? If you could afford it. <laughs> That was what everyone wanted. Everyone had to have the fair night. I, I have to say, a bit of a nine-day wonder, I think. For me, for my, you know, you can, I, yeah, I think I've heard enough milk bottles breaking now. Dave, um, what were the uh, keyboard choice, keyboards of choice for you in, in, in making the XCC music? Well, <laughs> choice. Most important element was studio grand piano. There were always... This is where, you know, my piano lessons finally came good because I was able to, for the first time, sit at a piano and enjoy what I was listening to because the piano at home was, you know, nothing special. I think that was really what put me off piano was the fact that it wasn't very rewarding for me as a player because what came out of it wasn't really the sound that I wanted to hear. When I got into the townhouse or any of the studio any of the professional studios that we worked in there would always be usually a yamaha grand and they sounded you know always in tune in the perfect acoustic environment and they always said whatever you did sounded fantastic so that rekindled my love for the piano that had probably ignited a love for the piano because up to that point i could take it or leave it but then i decided that um you know, if I just did a bit, a little bit of practicing and figured out some more of these, uh, some more, some more shapes. <laughs> Again, going back to Steely Dan, Donald Fagan, I loved his piano playing, his choice of chords, his chord choices. Love it. Absolutely love it. And of course, I know he sort of handed over a lot of keyboard duties to other musicians, but I just think the way his brain works the application of those jazz voicings in pop context, absolute, brilli absolutely brilliant. And I wanted some of that, to apply some of that thinking to XTC. Of course, we couldn't take a piano on the road. All we had, the Korg, Mini Korg 700S, little monophonic thing that made noises. And we got away with it for a time. Then we bought a Prophet 5. And that became the, the, the stage piano, uh, stage keyboard. So the Prophet had, 5 would have been used on like ball and chain melody, things like that? Uh, yes. I'm just, I'm just trying to remember 
whether we had the yes that's right because we had the profit for english settlement because i remember dialing up a marimba sound for it's nearly africa and uh, doing that on the profit so yeah that's when that arrived so all the synth sound on english all the synth sounds on english settlement being profit five so not really all electric about, pianos and things like that it's piano and then the synth is mainly profit five what's going yeah. on with with like all of the synth stuff that's happening in Homo uh, Safari and Somnambulist and these kinds of pieces. That would all have been Mini Korg, the little Korg 700S. Uh, and yes, the Somnambulist, I'm pretty sure, yes, that's right, it would have been the little synthesizer, that's all it was. As I say, we had to, let me tell the story. Please. Went to Olympic Studios because we had a top of the pops appearance and the BBC, or sorry, the Musicians Union insisted at the time that if you were going to mime on top of the pops, you would have to take a pre-recorded tape of your performance to prove that you'd played on the record. Some bizarre legislation, that's what they insisted on doing. So, and they would often send a representative down to the studio to make sure that you were doing what you were told. So we were at Olympic Studios. <clears throat> we went into the studio and did a rough, we bashed down a backing track to making plans for Nigel. I'm pretty sure that's what we were doing. And then we went, then we decided, right, that's got that done. Let's go over the pub. But we, we still had, you know, a few hours of studio time that MU had paid for, or the record company had paid for. So Andy says, well, you, you can go and have a curry. I'm going to, I've got something I want to do. Terry, before you go, can we, can I just take a loop of your kick drum? Here's what I want you to play. So Terry went out there, did the job. The engineer made a loop. And, said, and so he said, is that all you want? And Andy said, yep, that'll do fine. And so he took that loop and, uh, just with one finger built up these sounds one by one on the multi-track just him and this engineer and when we came back from our curry the pub i can't remember where we went we had this little song that served us as a b-side that's all we wanted to do you know it was like waste not want not got some studio time let's do something with it that's the sort of guy he is it's a, a beautifully atmospheric piece. It's lovely. I, I, I listened to it recently because uh, I'm going through my record collection now. Everything that was released 50 years ago this month, 40 years ago this month, and playing everything in my collection. It's all listed and indexed. Oh, yes. And so um, this came up on a sampler. I'd forgotten how lovely it was. A really, really nice little track. How about those other little instrumentals like Frost Circus and Procession to Learning Lab? Well, they were all done very in, in a similar style as Afterthoughts or in Downtime. Uh, I wasn't there for most of them, so I can't really tell you how Andy did it, but I, I don't think, I don't remember playing. I did play on one of uh, Procession Towards Learning Lab. Or, yeah, one of those, one of those, but I can't remember what I did. So those are Andy keyboard pieces? Yeah, I think so. I think they must have been, yeah. 